Sometimes when I hear the children's prayer, I think, oh, I think I want to go down with them this morning. But it's going to be good up here too. Yeah, that's what I like, a little responsive listening. It encourages me greatly. Good morning and welcome. I'm so glad you're here this morning. I'm sure that if you've seen the title, Relationship Remedy, you're so excited that all your relationship questions are about to be answered, right? In 30 minutes or less, we can do this. Probably not. But the Lord has something really, really good for you this morning, and I'm excited that you're here. A remedy is simply a treatment for a disease or an issue. Anybody here have relationship issues? Yeah. <laughs> that person that's the burr under your saddle, the person that you would rather walk the other way than cross paths with, the person that you stay awake thinking about at night. Uh, and some of you maybe are going, I have none of these. That's because you're it. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Relationships are incredibly important. Jesus said, John 13, 35, your love for one another will show the world that you're my disciples. This matters so much. And I believe because it matters so much is exactly why it's so incredibly difficult. How can it be that two amazing people can have conflict. I remember this shocking discovery in my marriage. He's awesome, I awesome, what the heck just happened? Right? Or no, you guys haven't had that experience. It matters so much that we are able to live in unity and love for one another even in our diversity. And because of that, Satan hates it. He comes against it all the time. Clearly, I can't cover it all this morning. I did make a handout for y'all. It's in your bulletin. There's an extra stack here. There's a stack in the usher's table. It's going to be online because I'm going to cover a lot of scriptural territory this morning. I want you to be able to do what's called discipleship. You take it, you dig into it, you mull on it, and you see what you can do with it in terms of action, okay? Because... Um, there's so many facets to healthy relationship. Communication, how personalities, right? There's a million things that you can do. Our library is full of good resources. I feel like our role as pastors and teachers in the church is to specifically focus on spiritual aspects of our relationships, because that's our assignment. You can go to a course and learn how to communicate better, and I recommend it, you should. I have, it's been helpful. More to learn. But let's look at some of the spiritual roots of what gets dysfunctional in our relationships. Before we go there, I just want to bless your spirit right now. In the name of Jesus, I bless your spirit to rise up and lead your soul and your body in connection to Jesus, to receive what he has for you today, to give you eyes that see and ears that hear and a heart that understands, because his heart for you is that you would live in community that lends strength. This is his desire for you, so I bless you in Jesus' name. I know that our understanding of God's plan and purpose for relationship has been really messed with by pop psychology. Not a single Hollywood movie has helped me have a better marriage, but Jesus has. So I want to go right to scripture, right to the very beginning, and though everything I'm saying today is not about marriages, because we're not all married, but we are all in relationship. There's still principles that apply from this. So starting in the very beginning, Genesis 2 verse 7, it says, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. This blows my mind, you guys. There's so much beauty in it that I probably can't linger on too long, but when I think of the Lord forming, this word form is like a sculptor working. Kind of look around at the guys around you. God, like a sculptor, formed. It, it, it's this pressure and this shaping. Man. And man, in all his diversity, is distinct. Man. And God, God breathed into him. Take a deep breath. The very breath in your lungs is life given to you by God. It's so significant and it's so important. When we consider the creator's design and purpose, it adds dignity and value. 
Pop culture makes fun of men all the time. Pay attention to sitcoms. Now, things are funny because there's always an element of truth, whether it's about men or about women. I get it, and I'm not trying to poop on that. But there becomes a tone and an attitude that's repeated and repeated and repeated that is disrespectful, and it dishonors who God created men to be. And I think that as a church and as people of God who understand God's forming and his purpose and his plan, we need to actually be intentional and fierce about the opposite of that. So ladies, I want you to look around at the men beside you, near you. We're not evenly split up by gender here in any way. So I want you to look beyond just your spouse. If you have a spouse, that's great. Go there first. But look beyond. This is the body of Christ these men are formed by God for a plan and purpose, filled with his breath. Would you be willing to just take this little awkward step and speak to those men? Would you say to them, I'm glad God made you? Now, like with your words. <laughs> Is there a guy that didn't get it because there's no women near him? I'm glad, I'm so glad God made you. We need you. And we need you to show up as God created you. And we bless you and we honor you in that. And we want to cheer you on, not mock you and put you down and disrespect you. We want to celebrate what God has done when he created man. Moving on to Genesis 2.18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone, and I will make a helper who is just right for him. Such a short little sentence with so much in it. This gets me every time. My idea of a perfect world some days, this is confession time, is paradise by myself with Jesus. It would seem that all of my problems would be solved here and now, would it not? And this is exactly where Adam lived and there was something desperately lacking. So that God himself said, this is not good. When God says something is not good, we better pay attention. And what did he say was not good? That he was alone. This tells me how powerful relationship is meant to be. And so if alone is not good, together is good, right? Right? That word means beautiful, better, best, bountiful, cheerful, at ease, fine, and glad. Perhaps, like me, you have sometimes said, together is too hard. Maybe even really honest, raw moments of relationships suck. Could we all just break agreement with that now in the name of Jesus? In the name of Jesus, we break agreement with a lie that alone is better that we're better off without community, that we're safer when we're not with other people. We break agreement with this lie in the name of Jesus. And Jesus, we ask you to take it far away, far away from us as a congregation and as a community, that our love for each other and our celebration of each other would represent the kingdom of heaven on earth. And here, this gets me a little bit. He said, when he made woman, that she's just right. How many of you ladies have felt not just right? You're not going to put your hand up. You're going to leave me here by myself in my wetness. <laughs> How many of you thought you're not the right kind of woman, the not sh the right shape of woman, the not the right personality, not liking all the things that women are supposed to, right? All these voices that say you are not right are lies from the pit of hell. God made you just right. He didn't make a mistake. Oh, is there refining to do? Don't worry, guys, I get it. But at the very essence and core of your wiring, design, destiny, and gifts, you are just right. And you need to know this. So guys, it's your turn. Look at the women around you. It doesn't have to be creepy. It's not. This is the prophetic word of God. 
This is speaking what God has said, and it needs to be uttered in sounds with eye contact. So look around you because there's clusters of women where there's no men, and this is your assignment from the Heavenly Father. I know this powerfully. I want you to turn, to move, to do whatever you have to, to look and make sure that every woman has been told at least once. I want you to look her in the eye and say, you are just right. Would you do it? There's a cluster of ladies over here, guys. I'm sorry, but I'm not moving on. <laughs> the whole human race is under assault. The whole entire human race is under assault at the very core of their identity. There is identity confusion in a million possible ways, and we must bless and affirm each other. We must speak what God has spoken. It's so important. I haven't met a man yet who hasn't felt assaulted by insecurity and inadequacy, has felt disrespected and dishonored by women. And I have yet to meet a woman who hasn't felt unprotected sometimes, like the men in her life haven't fought for her. This is our assignment as a church. We must do this first. We must show how it's to be done. Don't wait for a human to show you. Look to the creator and do what he does. Say what he says. We must do this for each other. We're not faking it till we make it. When we speak the truth, we release truth, and we also begin to feel truth. You and I are body, soul, and spirit. We are created in the image and likeness of God. These words are already absolutely true in the spirit. They are. It's our bodies and our souls that are out of alignment with this, our thoughts and our emotions. So when I speak that, or when you speak that to me and you say, Michelle, you are just right. If I receive that, oh, a calm comes over me. That is my mind, it's my emotions, it's my soul, my body comes into a place of peace. So this is why it's important. We need spirit, soul, and body alignment, not just to have a theology over here that doesn't affect our actions and our reactions. And then there's this tricky part of the verse where God says, it's not good for him to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. A lot of older translations use the word help meet. How many of you love this word? I do not have my hand up. I have heard this word like housewife. I have heard this word, I will make a dishwasher for him. No. No, 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 no. I don't know why I got that impression. It's okay. I don't need to dwell too long there. What I need to do is look at what does this word mean, this Hebrew word, ezer kenego. Anything but. Though perhaps including dishwasher. It means a warrior who's opposite but complementary. A perfect fit. Oh, it means a helper. A powerful and dangerous helper. A warrior. This word is only used to describe woman when God created her, the help of God, and a military alliance. It's a dangerous and powerful word. God decided Adam should have a warrior by his side. How cool is that? I think it's incredible. It excites me. What does all this mean? Oh, we will continue to explore it. This helper that God created was to complement man. She's worthy of protection and worth fighting for because she will help him and fight for him. Do you get it? We're not fighting with each other. We're fighting for each other. Someone told me once that the battle of the sexes will never be won because there's too much fraternizing with the enemy. Let's fraternize. I love it. God made our differences to complement each other. That is, fill in the gaps. That means that without each other, we have gaps. It doesn't mean if you're single, you have gaps. We have the body of Christ, right? We are a community where we work together. And without each other, there's gaps. Now, those differences sometimes seem inconvenient to me. It's not just me, is it? Our differences can become a place of frustration. They can become a power struggle, but God meant them to work together. Someone once told me an analogy that is the best one for me yet. 
and it's comparing the differences between men and women, like being a left hand and a right hand. They are so similar. Five phalanges on each side, nails on the tips, muscles on one side, you see the bones on the other. But they're not the same because if I took my left hand and sewed it, or right hand and sewed it on my left hand, it's all kinds of awkward and backwards. We need both of the hands. Did you know both of your hands together are more powerful than your dominant hand by itself? Of course it is. You would think I was utterly ridiculous if I told you that I'd be better off with two left hands. And yet we have believed we're better off without the opposite that sometimes frustrates us. It's simply the strategy of the enemy. We need each other. The differences are important. But we have to learn how to manage ourselves, how to cherish and value the differences. Uh, moving on to verse 26, then the Lord said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. And so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Based on this, I would say that one without the other fails to complete the image of God. We need all y'all to express the image and purpose of God on earth. And so the Lord God caused the man, in verse 21, to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs, or part of his side, and closed up the opening. And then God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed. I just love that. Just at last. This is something I've been missing and longing for. It's so beautiful. It's very interesting to me that the same word was not used to describe the creation of woman that was used to describe the creation of man. While God formed man like this sculptor, he took something from the man, not literally a rib. Girls, you are not a spare rib. He took something from the man, and it says he fashioned. It's a completely different word. He took something that was something different and fashioned something else. And can we just appreciate the fact that, that God used the word fashioned for women? It, to me, it speaks of when I need a new pair of shoes, don't fight it. But maybe I'm taking scripture too far there. So we'll move on. Verse 25, it says, Now man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. No shame. None. This is mind-blowing to me. No matter what your relationship, whether we're talking spouses, whether we're talking coworkers, if you think of what it would mean to show up with no edits, no anticipation and planning, I'll say it this way so they don't say that, and then I'll remember to do this so that they don't respond that. All those edits are fractures and breaking and disconnection. They're not freedom. What would it be to show up knowing you're loved and loving so well that there's no edits, no barriers. We were created for connection. And so in Genesis 3, it describes the fall. And because I'm trying to cover a lot of territory this morning, I don't want to read it all. But you know the story, right? Adam and Eve are by the one tree God said, don't eat from. And it says that they desired the wisdom this tree gave them, would give them. And so they ate the fruit. The one thing in this perfect paradise, God said, don't do. Genesis 3 verse 7 says, at that moment when they ate it, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. This is so interesting to me. It's at that moment their eyes were opened. If you were to translate every one of those words, just absolutely literally, it says, suddenly they were observant. Now, don't tell me that Adam hadn't observed Eve up until now. Of course he had. He had feasted his eyes on her and she on him. So what does it mean that suddenly they are observant? They're seeing things in a different way than they'd seen them before. They're seeing without, apart from the wisdom of God. I wonder if this could mean suddenly they were critical. As soon as we stop seeing as God sees, we tend to stop valuing each other 
and begin calling out judgment and condemnation, which creates shame and disconnection. And so we cover ourselves and we separate ourselves, body, soul, and spirit. We cease to be vulnerable and authentic. We cease to be safe for others with these observant eyes that don't see with the eyes of love. In verse 9, it says, Then the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? Do you think God didn't know where Adam was? He knows everything. Oh, this is an anguished cry. Where are you? Have you ever experienced that in a relationship that matters to you? Or you just want to look them in the eye and they won't look at you? And you know stuff is going on and it's not being shared with you? There's disconnection. There's this anguished cry. Where are you? I long for connection, intimacy, and friendship with you. God himself crying out, where are you? And then the worst part of all, I hate it so much. Verse 12, the blame game starts. God's asked, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree? I told you not to eat from. And the man replied, it was the woman you gave me. She gave me the fruit and I ate it. And then the, woman asked, the Lord asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied, and that's why I ate it. We disconnect because of sin, and sin leads to more disconnection, and there's a cycle of blame and shame and accusation and self-protection and self-medicating and anger and withdrawal. We have all done it. This is the effect of the fall on our deep and meaningful relationships, whether it's in marriage, in community, with coworkers, in ministry, fathers and sons and daughters and mothers and children. There's this blame game of accusation that says it's because of what you did that I did this. And there's disconnection. And depending on your personality, you'll either act in anger or withdrawal. And all of that is just brokenness. We do it because of pain, but please, are the, is this the end of the story? God goes on to describe the effects of the fall. Frustration for men in their daily assignments at work. Heartbreak in parenting. God is describing, not prescribing. He's not saying this is how I want it to be as a punishment for your sin. He's saying this is what's going to happen because of sin. I think this is really important. In verse 16, it describes a key relationship dynamic. He's talking to Eve, and he says, you will desire to control your husband, and he will rule over you. Does that sound like a good time to anybody? I hate this verse. I've read this verse and not known what to do with it. It has felt to me like you'll want a good relationship with your husband, and he'll always be the boss. This is awful. Nothing about this is good. So it was actually just over a year ago that I started digging into this verse a bit. What does this mean, God? I read commentaries. I read all the language translation things. I will spare you the length of that study and boil it down for you. God said because of sin, there will be a power struggle. Does this resonate with anybody? Have any of you tried to make decisions about your children? She's too soft. He's too hard. What do we do when we don't agree? For years, I just shut down. Peace at all costs, baby. There we go. Everything's good now, right? It's not. If I don't show up, that what God put inside of me doesn't show up. But I didn't know how to do conflict well. Peace at all costs is too expensive. But how on earth do we not engage in this power struggle when God says we're supposed to work together? We push and pull and against instead of together. Could it be more abysmal? Are you depressed yet? I just want you to be aware of it. We have to know it and name it so we can deal with it. So where does this exist in your relationships? Look it in the eye because we're about to go after it with truth and freedom. Okay? Romans 5, 15 to 17. Oh, this is the good news. There is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sins of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. The result of God's gracious gift is so very different from the result of that one man's sin. Adam's sin led to condemnation. 
But God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who will receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Can I have, yeah, a woohoo and an amen. The hopelessness has no voice over your relationships because of this. Brokenness and sin do not have the last word on any one of your relationships because of what Jesus has done. There has been a, may, a way made to triumph over this. There is nothing but hope for your relationships. We have all sinned. We have all shut each other out. We have all played the blame game. We have medicated our wounds in the wrong ways, but Jesus dis died to reverse the curse. He died to take the price of our sin on himself so that people around us don't have to bear the weight of our brokenness. How, though? How? It's good news, but what does it look like on the ground? Well, thankfully, Galatians 5 has given us a few handy-dandy lists. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 describes brokenness in the beginning. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy. Anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I've shortened up some of these verses just for time, but just ahead of this verse, it says that your flesh craves these things. Would you agree with me that sometimes when we have conflict, our response is hostility? Am I the only one who can get my head in a space of, and he said, and she should have, and then they, and, yeah? Hostility. My flesh craves to partner with this. It is satisfying to play the blame game. But it says, if I show up this way, there's absence of the kingdom of God. Do you want the kingdom of God displayed in your home and in your workplace? You, you can't participate in these things. Selfishness, selfish ambition, that's wanting to be ahead of you, to be on top, to be the boss. It's that power struggle. These outbursts of anger that we use to arm and protect ourselves, to make other people afraid to disagree with us or challenge us. These are all works of the flesh, and they do, if they're not bringing the kingdom of heaven, what are they bringing? What are you ushering in when you partner with any one of these things? See, I have to call it out this brutally so that I'll not want to do it, because my flesh craves it. I need to know how serious it is that when I show up giving myself over to any one of these things, I am partnering with the kingdom of darkness. None of us want to do that. It says, but the Holy Spirit, in the next verse, produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. One of these verses is describing the brokenness of the fall, and one of them is describing the restoration that Jesus brings. Think about the last time you experienced conflict in a relationship. How did you react, either with your actions or your attitude, your thoughts? Which list did it more represent? And how do we do this practically? How many of you have gotten tired of trying not to be angry? We need more than just what not to do. Sometimes we need to how to get from there to here. How do we do this? Well, we all have wounds from the past that we bring into the present. Consider three different conflict scenarios in your life. How did you feel in every one of them? You will find a theme, and therein you will find the strategy of the enemy. And this is yours to deal with. The pains in our past cause us to react in the present. We need to ask Jesus to show us what that is. We have unresolved things that make it easy for us to react with hostility and anger. The starting place for healing is forgiveness. It's forgiving the thing in the past that caused that wound in the first place 
and it's forgiving our person in the present who just poked that wound. Because we got to do life together. And we won't show up well when we're bleeding all over the place. Psalm 147.3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and he bandages their wounds. So we need healing from Jesus, both for things in the past and things for the present. We do this by working through forgiveness. We can do this even when the other person hasn't apologized. You don't have to wait for an apology to forgive someone, to be free of the bitterness and anger that has come into your relationship. I have found that when I still need to have a conversation to resolve something, because we do, whether it's at work or home or in other places, we have to have conversations to work things out. And we are too always two broken people showing up in a place trying to resolve a conflict. If I forgive first, I can show up full of the fruit of the Spirit. Even when it's challenging and difficult, I can still be patient and gentle and kind and long-suffering. But when I'm still angry because I haven't released that pain to Jesus and said, it's on you, Jesus, I receive healing from you, I can't. I'm so fragile and angsty and eh that I don't react well. We have to forgive. This is step one. Step two is confess my own sin. What? No, it's always the other person's fault. This is the blame game way back in Genesis. How many times has someone addressed your impatience or your anger and you've justified it because of this, this, and this? Oh, those are reasons, but they are not justification. We have to repent of our own sin. If we think, oh, 1 John 1, 8 says, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves. We have sinned. We have to confess it. God, forgive me. Yeah, God knows what the other person did, but God, forgive me for my pride, for the bitterness that I've allowed to settle in here. It's not all on you in any relationship, but it's all on you to do all that you can do. Got it? It's not all on you, but it's all on you to do all that you can do. So for me, that's dealing with my own junk, confessing my own sin, forgiving. And then we ask, Holy Spirit, come and fill us afresh. This makes space for the Spirit to work on our lives. We can't do this with the agenda that someone else will change. We do this with the plan and purpose that we be filled with the Holy Spirit because wherever we show up filled with the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of heaven is ushered in. We don't have to wait for everything to be perfect. We have to be yielded. He will come. He will come. The Spirit will come. And the Spirit brings reconciliation and restoration. A healthy relationship can have a robust conversation without any of these deeds of the flesh robbing us from connection. We can show up and rumble with thoughts and ideas and still be gentle and patient and kind. Jesus is full of mercy and truth. It doesn't mean that we don't address things. Of course we do. Jesus came with mercy and truth. Mercy is not a weird codependency that just lets everything stay broken so that we can have peace at all costs. It's a gentleness of spirit. So we need to show up with truth. Things are off kilter. We need to talk about them. But we show up with a gentleness of spirit, humility. And we can show up with boundaries and still have an open heart. Now, this is tricky, and I want you to hear me say that we don't stay in abusive relationships. That's not what Scripture's talking about. God set a boundary for Adam and Eve after they sinned. He said, you can't come back into the garden, to the tree of life. It wouldn't be good for you. You eat from the tree of life, you'll live broken forever. That boundary wasn't punishment. So sometimes we create boundaries and we say we're creating a boundary, but what we're doing is trying to punish the other person. That is not a godly boundary. God's boundaries are all about protection. So sometimes we set a boundary and we say, I can't continue this conversation right now. There's anger. It's not okay. That's a protection. I'm protecting what God says is precious, but I'd like to finish the conversation later. There's still a reaching out for connection. Boundaries are not for punishment, they're for protection. 
If you are shutting someone else to manipulate them into your way of seeing, thinking, and doing, that is sin. When you're establishing a boundary to protect what God says is precious, you're not withholding love, but you are drawing a line to protect what God says is precious. It's a big topic, but I wanted to touch on it. When God sent them from the garden and he said, you can't come back, he never withdrew his love. Not even for half a minute did he withdraw his love for them. His love for them was huge and extravagant. I don't know how to do this well, but I know that I can if I hang out with my Father God. We can't love well unless we know we are loved. And so as I pondered this this week, I, I, I kind of wanted to come back full circle. I recognized in my own heart that when relationships are difficult, what I want to do is withdraw avoid, escape, make it stop. You might have a different strategy. The Lord brought James 1 verse 2 to my mind, and I looked it up, and I know this verse, and then I read it in a several translations, and I love the message, so I'm going to read it to you now. It says, consider it a gift, my friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open, and it shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. So as you consider your difficult relationships and how much you would like it to just be like, fix it, Jesus, get me out of here now, Jesus is inviting you to lean into him. Don't try to escape it. Let it do its work in you. This is ushering in the kingdom of heaven. So as I come to the end, I want to come full circle with the Garden of Eden story. If we are not engaging in the power struggle, blaming or withdrawing, what are we doing? Are we, if we're not fighting with each other, how are we fighting for each other? I have to say I'm shocked with the verse I landed on. It will be many of your favorites. Would you look at Ephesians 5, 21 and 22 with me? It says, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. How many of you love that word submit? Some of y'all got your blood pressure up just hearing it. That's how I feel when I hear it. What does it mean? Does it mean to push each other down and rule with an iron fist? Well, it actually can't mean that. Because it says submit to one another. And if we're both trying to rule over the other, we're back in the power struggle of Genesis 3. So what on earth does it look like? What indeed? How do we submit to each other? Well, different translations pick better words, but here we go. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. The same root word for this word submit is used in scripture in other places, such as being under the care of a physician, or Philip sitting under the tree when Jesus came to him. This is not a bad place to be. It can also mean, um, it's not like under as in a case of being ruled over, but under as in protected and cared for. Are you willing to receive protection and care from your spouse? Sometimes, strangely, I've noticed we rebel against this. What is that? That's the brokenness of the fall. A few minutes ago, the men declared the word of God to the women. They said, you are just right. Do you know that if you received that as truth, you submitted to that word? It's not an evil thing of ruling over. It's receiving. I, it's beautiful. You came under the covering and protection of those words. They provided shelter over you from the assault of the enemy and from the voices of the world around you. It also contains all the nuances, nuances of supporting someone in their mission. Under, not as in suppressed, but in a role of support. And all of a sudden it sounds to me like Azer Kenego, that warrior woman who lends her strength and support to her husband in his mission. That's a powerful, beautiful thing. Rather than disrespect and nitpicking and nagging, 
We can come along with support and encouragement, not waiting for perfection, whatever that is, none of us are, but calling out that which is good and honest and true and powerful and a gift as we just did. That's coming under and lending strength and support. And it says, how do husbands do this? They demonstrate tender devotion to their wives as Christ does to the church. Christ recognizes the imperfections in his church, the shortcomings, yet he does not shame her. Rather, he lends her his strength. Again, that submitting, that coming under and lending support. This is how we submit to each other. He extends grace, he protects her, he fights for her. Neither one of these roles are critical, nitpicky, or full of blame and accusation. Remember when the, in the fall their eyes were opened and they became observant? We need to see each other with the eyes of Christ. As I close, I'm just going to tell you how this happened for me recently because it was really powerful to me. Some of this message I preached in Stetler at the marriage retreat, that was a month ago. You guys were praying for us. Brian and I were there. Before I got up to speak, um, someone interviewed Brian. And I admit, I was really nervous about this. <laughs> what would he say? I wasn't in control of this situation. What if something he said set me off and then I had to get up and speak? Being honest about marriage here. I appreciate the smiles of the fellowship of the suffering. Because we have not all yet attained to the fullness of the glory of God, we've caused each other pain in relationships. We, it's a minefield. And so they interviewed Brian. And some of the funny questions, not funny, they weren't funny. They're questions people genuinely wonder. And one of the things they asked Brian was, how do you handle your wife and her role? <laughs> Would any of you ladies be nervous along with me for just a half a second? What was he going to say? He was really, this man was asking, do you feel intimidated by her? Plain and simple. And Brian said, no. He said, I see the call that God has on her, that she is gifted in a way and I am gifted in a way. And our gifts work together. And so I cheer her on. And he said things in that conversation that I've not heard him say before. And I was a bit of a mess. And now I'm supposed to teach. <laughs> but I didn't resist a single one of them. I came under them. And the thing I noticed when I stood up to do my teaching is that I was absolutely unfettered. I had never felt so force forward, moving, released, blessed, powerful. I was like, what has just happened here? I dreaded and was nervous about this session for weeks because if I didn't do it right, it would be wrong. It would be bad. His words provided protection and covering over me. I, in my role of being protected by that, in no way was I squished down. As Christ honors the body, he had lifted me up. And under the protection of his words and with his blessing, I was able to do what God created and called me to do in an amazing way. I will admit it, and I know it was the power of the Spirit moving through the voice of my husband who was using the authority that God has given him. It was amazing and it was wonderful. And in a nutshell, it gave me a glimpse. This is what God has for us. Not just in our marriages. You work with people who God has created, called, and gift and honored. They might be difficult in some ways, but there's a gift in them for you. Would you bless and honor them? Would you forgive them for the ways that they are difficult sometimes? And would you ask God to help you see as he sees so that you can bless and honor them, so that you can call out what he sees? When I stay in a posture of acknowledging this bugs me. It doesn't help me to pretend it doesn't. But maybe there's a gift here. Thank you, Lord, for this person. I bless them with knowing how much they're loved. The kingdom of heaven comes into the relationship. Would you stand with me? I want us to just take a few minutes here to do some business with Jesus. There'll be more to do later. There is a handout to help you with it. <coughs> but would you just pray with me? Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father God, we acknowledge that we have sinned in our relationships. That we have used pride and anger 
that we have blamed and accused, that we have wanted the upper hand. And God, together we ask you that you would forgive us. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come. By the power of the blood of Jesus, cleanse us from this sin. Remove it from our relationships. And I thank you, God, that you are not oblivious to the pain others have caused us either. And so as we humble ourselves before you, we also release those ones who have hurt us. We forgive because you've forgiven us. And we release others in our lives from those judgments and those blaming, accusing, accusing words, God. Forgive us for making them. We release them and we bless them. We speak blessing over the relationships in our lives. We speak flourishing. And we speak the word of God over our relationships that it is good for us to do life together. Spirit, would you continue to speak to us? Stir us up, awaken us, and give us eyes to see each other as you see. And then, Lord, would you give us the courage to lean into that? We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Such a good and perfect song for our ending. God, come and walk me out of my hiding place, the places I've gone to protect myself, but that have cut me off from deep and meaningful relationship. As we go today, I want to bless you right now in Jesus' name. I bless you with anticipation of goodness in your relationships because of what God has done. I bless you with a filling of the Spirit that would empower you and grant you courage to lean in rather than pull back. I bless you with clarity from the heart of the Father for what you need to do, action steps of confession and forgiveness and repentance and making reconciliation, making amends. And I bless you with freedom from ungodly bonds that have held you in places that Jesus is not holding you. May you be released in freedom today in Jesus' name. And finally, from 1 Peter 4, 8, I bless you too, above all, Constantly echo God's intense love for one another, for love will be a canopy over a multitude of sins. We have prayer people that are going to be up here at the front. If you would like prayer today, for any reason, come on up. If you want to sit here, the worship team is going to continue to play and sing. You just sit here in the presence of Jesus and let him minister to you. And as you go, may you go in peace. Take the handout rumble through this stuff. Seek the Lord. He will bring health and wholeness to your relationships. This is the power of the gospel. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>